Hello everyone. I am myself Dr. Rajesh Gubba. In this particular session, I will be discussing a very important topic in the cardiology that is the cardiac tumors and out of which the very very important part of the discussion will be on the atrial tumor. So if you take the cardiac tumors, so how do we classify them is the primary tumors and as well as the metastatic tumors. So what are the primary tumors? The tumors which are originating within the heart right the one which are or, uh, arising within the heart they are called as the primary tumors whereas the tumors which are coming into the heart from the external organs then we call it as the metastatic tumors now between these two which tumors are very common is it the metastatic tumors or the primary tumors remember the primary tumors are uncommon it is the metastatic tumors which comprises a lot then compared to that of the primary tumors of the heart now you need to be aware of what will be the clinical presentation remember most of the times these tumors they are found incidentally so the individual is asymptomatic right the patient is the asymptomatic at the time of the diagnosis why because most of these tumors they are found incidentally now how do we classify this uh, primary tumors is these primary tumors again we classify them into the benign tumors then malignant tumors right benign tumors and the malignant tumors so this is how we classify now these tumors they are found in the form of mass on two dimensional echocardiography so what will be the, the differential diagnosis for this primary tumors so if you take the differential diagnosis we can confuse the vegetation of the infective endocarditis as a tumor we can get confused the myocardial hypertrophy as the tumor right and another very important differential diagnosis is that presence of inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors right inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors so these are the one which are considered as the differential diagnosis for the primary tumors now the next point is what will be the first line investigation remember it is the two dimensional echocardiography by which you can diagnose or you can visualize the presence of a mass or a tumor within the heart so this will be the initial imaging modality used to evaluate the cardiac tumors now out of which if you take the primary tumors so primary tumors we have discussed that they are like benign and as well as malignant tumors so first let me discuss the primary and then we will move on to the discussion of the malignant tumors so primary tumors as such the incidence is very rare right they are found in 1 in 2000 autopsies okay and out of that you take the benign tumors in the primary tumor the most common are the benign tumor and next the 25 percent that is one fourth will be the malignant tumors so remember between the benign and malignant tumor it is the benign tumors which are more common than compared to that of the malignant tumors now these benign tumors which are almost like three fourth the majority of them are myxomas whereas malignant tumors if you see 25 percent of them whichever are there they are nothing but the sarcomas right they are sarcomas now at the time of diagnosis they may, individual may, might be asymptomatic but these tumors either you take benign tumor or malignant tumor they have the tendency of causing life threatening complications what are those we will be discussing now so that is the reason why the early diagnosis of the tumor and the surgical resection is very very important in order to avoid this life threatening complications so if you see the clinical manifestations you have cardiac and as well as the non cardiac manifestations out of which you take the cardiac manifestations they all completely depends upon the size of the tumor location of the tumor and what are the surrounding structures surrounding the tumor right based on these three the cardiac manifestations will be there depending upon the size location of the tumor and the structures which are surrounding the tumor now one of the cardiac manifestation is the chest pain so what would be the mechanism for chest pain chest pain multiple mechanisms can be explained for example if the tumor is present at left ventricular outflow tract the cardiac output will be reduced and when the individual is during any exertion activity myocardial oxygen demand is more 
but because of the tumor at the ventricular outflow tract the cardiac output is decreased so demand is more supply is less thereby the individual can have the angina okay or there are some tumors which are originating directly from the valves so if any tumor is originating from the aortic valve then also it can reduce the cardiac output and next is these patients they can also present with syncopal attack again the mechanism is same whenever the outflow is reduced because of the obstruction at the outflow tract the cerebral perfusion will be reduced and thereby the individual will have the syncopal attack next is the development of the congestive heart failure right so what would be the reason because the metabolic demand is more for the myocardium but if the adequate amount of the blood supply is not there to the myocardial muscle then the muscle the heart may go into a state of the congestive heart failure wherein the individual will have left sided heart failure and right sided heart failure features left sided heart failure features include the development of dyspnea and as well as fatigability so dyspnea is because of pulmonary edema and fatigability is because of decrease in the cardiac output from the left side and if it is right sided failure the, the patient can have the raised jvp tender hepatomegaly ascites presence of pedal edema all these are the manifestations of your congestive heart failure particularly the right sided heart failure now depending upon the location of the murmur on auscultation you can also listen the cardiac murmurs and it all depends upon where the tumor is is it present in the Uh, ventricular inflow tract or whether the tumor is present in the ventricular outflow tract and next is the life threatening complications what we were discussing what we need to know is these uh, tumors they can throw arrhythmias where the individual will develop vt or vf and then they can have sudden cardiac death and these tumors can cause the compression of the av node and that makes the individual to develop the conduction abnormalities in the form of complete heart block even that can cause bradi arrhythmias and sudden death of the individual and these tumors let me tell you they can also cause the serous cavity abnormalities and that serous cavity abnormalities will be in the form of the pericardial effusion and the emergency will be in the form of the cardiac tamponade and this cardiac tamponade the clinical presentation of the patient will be in the form of sudden onset dyspnea and once the patient develops cardiac tamponade they require emergency pericardiocentesis that is what you see in case of cardiac tamponade and the other problem is that these tumors like they are fragile or they are like friable and these tumors once they rupture they go in the form of emboli into the systemic circulation so even there can be embolic phenomenon right even there can be embolic phenomenon now what are the non cardiac manifestations non cardiac manifestations they are the constitutional symptoms and what are those constitutional symptoms and why do you get this constitutional symptoms i will discuss in detail okay constitutional symptoms will be mainly in the form of fever and they are mainly because of release of the inflammatory mediators like interleukins i will discuss that in detail in case of the myxoma now let me discuss about so let me discuss about the myxoma which is the primary tumor of the heart okay and so these are the most common primary tumor of the heart and these myxomas as i have already discussed they are the benign tumors they are the benign tumors and among the cardiac tumors these myxomas they constitute one third right they constitute one third to one fourth of all the cases Hmm, they constitute around one third to one fourth of all the cases. Now, what will be the age uh, at which you can have the clinical presentation in the individual with myxomas? So, usually the clinical presentation is around third to sixth decade of life, and these uh, atrial myxomas or the cardiac myxomas they are very common in females rather than males. so the female predilection is more common than compared to that of the males now some of these myxomas like they are sporadic and some of these myxomas they have the familial but which is more common 90% of the myxomas they are sporadic it is only 10% of the myxomas they are familial and what is the type of inheritance in case of familial it is autosomal dominant form of transmission will be there now we have discussed that there is familial transmission in 10 percentage of individuals now what is that clinical entity which has the familial transmission that is nothing but the carney complex hmm? that is nothing but the carney complex so carney complex it is the type of the atrial myxoma which has the familial transmission which is seen in almost 10 percentage of individuals and the type of transmission is autosomal dominant type of transmission and this carney complex it is characterized by a triad right number 1 you have the presence of the myxomas right and what are those myxomas 
these myxomas they may originate within the heart that is cardiac myxomas they may originate in the skin that is the cutaneous myxomas and they may originate even from the mammary gland that is the myxomas originating from the breast and next is the lentigens right next is the lentigens lentigens are nothing but the hyperpigmented patches that you can see within the skin right so lentigens and not only lentigens there can be also the pigmented nevi right now the next important is the endocrine overactivity now what will be this endocrine overactivity in the carne complex endocrine overactivity will be in the form of the adrenal cortical hyperplasias right that will be cushings right that will be in the form of the cushing syndrome and the tumors may also originate from the testicles in males that is they can also have the testicular tumors and these individuals they also develop the pituitary tumors and these pituitary tumors they are the one which will be producing excess amount of growth hormone and because these pituitary tumors are producing excess amount of growth hormone the individual may land up in what is called acromegaly okay so the tumors which will be producing excess amount of growth hormone they are called as somatotroph type of cells right so pituitary tumors are the one which are originating from somatotroph cells which are producing excess amount of growth hormone so this is a triad in case of the carne complex one is your myxomas cardiac cutaneous and breast myxomas then lentigens and pigmented nevi and next is the endocrine overactivity and that endocrine overactivity it is in the form of like cushing's testicular tumor or the pituitary tumor now we have two important subsets of the carne complex what are those two important subsets of the carne complex is one is the name syndrome and the other one is the lamb syndrome now what is this name syndrome and what is this lamb syndrome let me tell this is actually a numeric the components of the name syndrome the word n stands for presence of the nevi that is the hyperpigmented patches the word a stands for the presence of the atrial myxoma right the presence of the atrial myxoma and the word m stands for myxoid neurofibroma right the presence of myxoid neurofibroma and the word e stands for ephylites okay so this is what is your name syndrome right and what is your uh, ephylite ephylis actually ephylis is a singular ephylites is plural ephylis it is basically a cutaneous manifestations where you have the cutaneous manifestation in the form of a freckle and there will be a small light brown or tan mark of the skin right it's a freckle where you have a small brown tan mark which is present over the skin so that is what is nothing but your ephylis now coming to the lamb syndrome this is another sub subset of the carne complex now the word l stands for the presence of the lentigens right the word a is the atrial myxoma right or am is your atrial myxoma the word b is the blue nevi okay so this is what is your lamb syndrome right so these are the two important subsets of the carne complex which constitutes the familial form of your atrial myxoma and autosomal dominant type of transmission right now if you see the the pathogenesis and as well as the pathology of the atrial myxoma so pathogenesis is mainly because of the gene mutation now what is the gene which is being mutated for the development of the atrial myxoma that is prk ar1 a gene right so only thing so how can you remember this is like parker but the only thing you don't have pa it is pr so a you can just consider it has been shifted after one so pr kar 1a now what exactly is this gene this is a tumor suppressor gene so it is the mutation of right it is the mutation of this tumor suppressor gene that is what is responsible for the development of the atrial myxoma and this prkr gene it encodes a protein right it encodes an enzyme that is protein kinase a type 1 
right so this prkr it encodes the enzyme called protein kinase a type 1 now if you take the pathology of this atrial myxomas how are they remember these atrial myxomas they are gelatinous structures right and this gelatinous structures they consist of the stroma which is right they consist of the stroma which is rich in glycosaminoglycons right which is rich in glycosaminoglycons okay so that is about your atrial myxomas so pathogenesis is mainly because of your genetic mutation pathologies is like they are gelatinous structures containing stroma which is rich in the glycosaminoglycons now these atrial myxomas as already i have discussed 90 percentage of them they are like sporadic and 10 percentage of them they are the familial tumors and the transmission is the autosomal dominant type of transmission now out of this your sporadic tumors if you see they are the single tumors that they are solitary tumors and where do they originate from these uh, sporadic tumors they originate from the interatrial septum exactly at the vicinity of that means near the fossa ovalis of the interatrial septum so on which side these tumors are being present they are present within the left atrium and these tumors please remember they are pedunculated right these tumors they are pedunculated okay right then coming to the familial tumors these familial tumors they are like the syndromic tumors just now we have discussed that is the carne complex right these tumors they are present in the young individuals right but they are not solitary they are multiple in number whereas sporadic tumors they are single but whereas this they are multiple in number and these sporadic tumors they are of atrial origin that is interatrial septum but these tumors they are ventricular in location right and these tumors what they do they more likely to recur after the initial resection so the chance of recurrence is high with the familial tumors even after the resection now if the tumor is present within the atria what will be the abnormality if the tumor is present within the ventricle what will be the abnormality now you see here now you take this the uh, sporadic tumors they are the solitary tumors right they are present they are originating from the interatrial septum so now that can give the picture of either stenosis or the perforation so basically all these myxomas which are present in the atria they can cause the the obstruction of the inflow tract of the ventricle and the ventricular tumors they cause the obstruction of the ventricular outflow tract so they you have obstructive signs and symptoms now you take the atrial myxomas right the atrial myxomas the one which are present within the atria you know this particular tumor that is the atrial myxoma which is originating from the interatrial septum right which is originating from interatrial septum it can prolapse right it can prolapse onto mitral valve right so once it prolapses onto the mitral valve orifice right once it prolapses onto the mitral valve orifice that will give the picture of the mitral stenosis right and these myxomas you know they can also cause the tumor induced valve trauma now once there is trauma to the mitral valve you know the patient can also have the picture in the form of the mitral regurgitation right so that is about the sporadic tumors which are originating from interatrial septum the picture can be in the form of ms or the mr whereas you take the ventricular myxomas the familial tumors they are uh, present within the ventricles so these ventricular tumors they cause the obstruction of the ventricular outflow tract right they cause the obstruction of the ventricular outflow tract so once there is obstruction of the ventricular outflow tract so how it the picture will be the picture will be either in the form of the aortic stenosis or if it is on the right side it could be in the form of the pulmonary stenosis so this will give you a picture similar to that of subiotic stenosis or subpulmonic stenosis okay and so already we have discussed in the beginning itself the clinical features completely depends upon the location of the tumors right and most of these the clinical features they will be of sudden in onset 
right most of them they are sudden in onset because see whenever the individual changes his position because of the gravity also like for example you take these uh, tumors which are present within the atria whenever the individual is sitting from supine position or when the individual is standing from supine position because of the gravity the tumor can prolapse onto the mitral valve orifice so thereby what will happen the ventricular inflow will be reduced and thereby cardiac output will be reduced so the individual can have syncopal attack or the angina okay so the clinical features are sudden right and it completely depends upon the size of the tumor location of the tumor and change in the position of the tumor because of the gravity right now the another important set of the clinical manifestation is the embolic events so these are the friable tumors right so they can easily rupture so these patients the they can develop the peripheral emboli right when the emboli enter into the systemic circulation or they can develop right or they can develop the pulmonary embolism so the patient can have the peripheral or pulmonary embolic phenomenon right so because these tumors they are fragile so they can get easily fragmented now the next thing is the constitutional symptoms in these individuals so constitutional symptoms uh, with malignancy will be in the form of fever next weight loss and they can also develop excessive fatigability that is in the form of cachexia and as well as melis they also develop arthralgia and they can also have the development of rash all over the body and on examination of the fingers you know they'll have the presence of clubbing and they also develop raynaud's phenomenon right so where there will be the peripheral vasoconstriction of the digits on exposure to the cold so raynaud's phenomenon so these are the constitutional symptoms but you have to remember that the development of these constitutional symptoms are mainly because of the results release of the cytokines by the tumors okay and what is that particular cytokine which is responsible for the development of these constitutional symptom is that is interleukin 6 okay so these are the clinical manifestations that you come across in patients with the atrial myxoma so now very simple sporadic tumors familial tumors sporadic tumors are the atrial tumors so picture will be similar to that of ms or the mr if there is perforation of the valve and familial tumors they are ventricular in location so they can cause the obstruction of the ventricular outflow tract so the picture will be in the form of as or the ps and the next thing is because these tumors are fragile the embolic phenomenon is very common and constitutional symptoms will be there because of release of cytokines that is the interleukin 6 then on examination what is that you will see or what is that you will find in case of the atrial myxoma so on examination you will listen a low pitched tumor right low pitched sound and that particular sound will be a tumor plop right that particular sound will be the tumor plop and it is a diastolic sound so it is early to mid diastolic sound right it is early to mid diastolic sound now why you get this particular sound the reason is that you see now this is the four chambered heart right and this is the atrial myxoma which is originating from interatrial septum right that is the sporadic tumors and when the atria is contracting the ventricle will be in a state of relaxation so once the blood is trying to move from the atria to the ventricle so this blood flow can cause the shift of this tumor and it can hit the mitral valve annulus so because of the hit of the tumor to this mitral valve orifice you can listen a sound that will be a tumor plop which is a low pitched sound and this is occurring during the diastole of the ventricle so that is the reason why it is considered as the diastolic sound now what will be the laboratory findings this is about the atrial myxoma clinical features now what will be the laboratory findings in patients with the atrial myxoma so if you do a complete blood picture and some of the analysis i'll tell you so these patients they can have the hyper gamma globulinemia why is that these patients with atrial myxoma develop hyper gamma globulinemia is because there is a mechanism for that see these tumors can stimulate the immune system hyper gamma globulinemia in case of atrial myxoma may occur due to production of the specific antibodies against the tumor right production of the specific antibodies against the tumor cells 
and these antibodies you know they will further stimulate the immune system right once they further stimulate the immune system there will be increased production of the gamma globulins right the increased production of the gamma globulins and that will result in what is called as the hyper gamma globulinemia right next then the if you take the complete blood picture these patients can also have the presence of or the development of the anemia and even the polycythemia so first let me explain to you like why is that these individuals are developing the polycythemia first see these tumors are the source for the release of the erythropoietin right these are the tumors which are the source for the release of the erythropoietin actually erythropoietin is being produced from the kidney 85% 15% from the liver but these atrial myxomas you know they act as the ectopic source right they act as the ectopic source for the release of the erythropoietin and if suppose if the erythropoietin is being produced in excess quantity then there can be development of the polycythemia now these patients they can also develop anemia but that is very rare but why is that they can develop anemia is if this atrial myxoma if it is metastasizing to the bone marrow causing bone marrow suppression then they can also develop anemia it all depends right but in the same patient you cannot have polycythemia and as well as anemia right so some tumors can produce excessive erythropoietin causing polycythemia and some tumors they can uh, metas even though it's a benign tumor it can cause the anemia right and next thing is the leukocytosis why is that these uh, atrial myxomas are causing the leukocytosis remember these myxomas they can get infected right they can get infected so if these myxomas are infected that will lead to the activation of the immune system and that will cause increase in the number of the white blood cells and not only that these myxomas they also induce the inflammation of the surrounding structures so once they cause the inflammation of the surrounding structures even that can also cause increase in your wbcs that leads to the leukocytosis and these individuals they can have thrombocytopenia or thrombocytosis now why is that they develop thrombocytopenia see any malignancy it is a hypercoagulable state right so there is tendency of the formation of a clot and into this clot the platelets they get resorbed because the platelets are the component of the clot so there will be excessive consumption of the platelets for the formation of the clot and that can result in the development of thrombocytopenia and these patients occasionally they can also have thrombocytosis why is that because these myxomas they cause the production of the growth factors right they, they can cause the production of the growth factors and these growth factors which are being released from the myxoma they can act on the bone marrow and causes the thrombocytosis right and next thing is the elevated esr why is that just now we have discussed these tumors can induce the inflammation so that is the reason why there can be elevated esr and even there can be elevated c reactive protein as well so these are the laboratory anomalies that you can come across in patients with the atrial myxoma right and see because of this clinical uh, this laboratory findings it gives a differential diagnosis of the endocarditis because in endocarditis there will be leukocytosis right and it may also give you a picture of the paraneoplastic syndromes okay right now what are the other specific investigations for localizing the tumor so the first line investigation is definitely the two dimensional echocardiography but for better visualization you can also use the three dimensional transthoracic echocardiography or transesophageal echocardiography so by doing this echocardiography either by two dimensional or three dimensional we will be able to make out the size of the tumor we will be able to determine where is the location of the tumor and we will be able to make out whether the tumor is pedunculated or the one which does not have the stalk and it also gives you an idea of planning the treatment okay so planning for surgical excision so that all we will be able to make out by the two dimensional echocardiography next is the ct and as well as the mri one point you have to remember is that i said you 10 percentage of these tumors they are like familial so that is the reason why all the first degree relatives and that to what type of inheritance autosomal dominant type of inheritance so that is the reason why all the first degree relatives right they have to undergo this two dimensional echocardiography
right they have to undergo this two dimensional echocardiography okay next is the ct and as well as the mri now what is the purpose of doing this ct and as well as mri before that let me show you the two dimensional image of the myxomas so you see here this is the atrial myxoma which is present within the left atrium and it is originating from the interatrial septum right it is originating from the interatrial septum and this particular image a right so it is it is filling the entire left atrium in systole you can see that right and then it is also prolapsing onto the mitral valve that gives you a picture of the mitral stenosis okay so this is about like how the uh, atrial myxoma appears in the 2d echo now the next is the ct and as well as the mri so what is the purpose of making the ct and as well as mri is again the same thing we can give the definitive size we can clearly measure based on the ct and mri and we can also determine the shape of the tumor right we can determine what is the composition of the tumor and how is the surface of the tumor that is surface composition of the tumor that can be made out easily by ct and mri and we will be also able to make out if there is any extra cardiac involvement right so all this we will be able to make out by doing the ct and as well as mri now let me show you an image of the uh, MRI where you can see the tumor you can see this is the myxoma which is present within the left atrium so this is a cardiac magnetic resonance imaging demonstrating the round mass within the left atrium right and next important is about the cardiac catheterization and as well as coronary angiogram do you require this let me tell you see this cardiac catheterization and as well as the coronary angiography these were done previously right but in the recent times they are no longer being used they are no longer being used okay so when do we do this is when the non invasive imaging studies are not giving you a clear picture then we do this cardiac catheterization but in the recent times we are not doing this cardiac catheterization because there is chance of embolization because there is chance of embolization when you do the cardiac catheterization so that is the reason why these cardiac catheterization should be avoided and next thing is the coronary angiogram that is mainly to look for if there is associated coronary artery disease we will do the coronary angiogram otherwise even the coronary angiogram is also not being done so this uh, this cardiac catheterization right you need to be very careful whenever you are doing because there is risk of the tumor embolization but in the recent times we are not doing if the non invasive imaging modality is giving you a clear picture of the image then how do you treat this the atrial myxoma remember the surgical uh, excision using cardiopulmonary bypass right surgical excision using cardiopulmonary bypass you know that is the best method of the treatment for the atrial myxoma so whatever might be the size you can do the surgical excision right and what about the recurrence remember the chance of recurrence is very high for familial cases so 12 to 22 percent is the chance of recurrence for the familial tumors that is your carne complex and the chance of recurrence for sporadic tumors is just only one to two percent so the recurrence is less common for the sporadic tumors right and the tumor recurrence most likely results from the multifocal lesions right see why is that the familial tumors there is high chance of recurrence because these familial tumors they are having the multifocal lesions whereas if you take the sporadic tumors the sporadic tumors right why is that you are having the chance of recurrence in case of sporadic tumors is because if you have done incomplete resection right if you have done incomplete tumor resection then there is chance of recurrence in case of the sporadic tumors okay so this is about the atrial myxoma which is one of the most common primary benign tumor then coming to the other benign tumors that includes the cardiac lipoma these cardiac lipomas although they are relatively common most of the times they are being diagnosed incidentally at post mortem examination that means majority of the times these are asymptomatic and because they are found uh, incidentally on post mortem examination that is the reason why they are called as the incidentalomas 
Now, what will be the size of these uh, cardiac lipomas? These cardiac lipomas, they grow up to a size of the 15 centimeters, right? And that is the reason why, you know, these particular tumors, they cause the degeneration or they remove the differentiation of the cardiac silhet. So, on chest x-ray, you will find the abnormality of, right, abnormality of the cardiac silhet, okay. Now, what these particular tumors can cause, right, what will be the clinical features? Remember, these tumors, they interfere with the cardiac function, like the cardiac output, and they can also cause the compression of the blood supply to the myocardium causing the angina. These uh, arrhythmias, they are also arrhythmogenic, right? And these arrhythmias, they also cause the conduction disturbances, okay? So, these are the abnormalities of the cardiac lipomas. So, most of the times they are being found incidentally. The size of the tumor is around 15 centimeters and they cause the abnormality of the cardiac silhouette on the chest x-ray. And the treatment is you need to do surgical resection. That is about your the cardiac lipomas. And another important benign tumor is the papillary fibroelastoma. This papillary fibroelastoma, remember, they are highly friable tumors. And the appearance is they have a frond-like appearance. Right? Frond-like appearance. And where are these tumors originating from? These are the tumors which originate from the cardiac valves, right? And these tumors, whenever they originate, they originate as the solitary. That means they are the single tumors, right? Solitary tumors. And these are the most common benign tumors of the cardiac valves. If you take atrial myxoma, they are originating from interatrial septum and some of them are found in the ventricle. But these are the tumors which are originating from the cardiac valves and these are the most common tumors which are originating from the cardiac valves, which are those, the papillary fibroelastomas. Now, what about this cytomegalovirus? See, the autopsies, what has been done and when the tumor was examined, it has been found that there is the cytomegalovirus in this particular tumor. That is the reason why what has been anticipated is, right, the cause of the development of papillary fibroelastoma is, it results from chronic viral endocarditis, right. So, most of the tumors, they was containing the cytomegalovirus on the pathological examination of the tumor. So, the etiology of the tumor, what has been said is, it could be secondary to chronic viral endocarditis. Now, what are the clinical features? Basically, they are originating from the valve. So, these patients, they develop valve impairment or valve dysfunction. And these tumors, like they are highly friable tumors. So, there is a very high chance of the embolization. Right, there is a very high chance of the embolization. Now, because there is very high chance of embolization, they can develop transient ischemic attack. They can develop stroke. They can also develop the myocardial infarction. So, these will be the problems with the papillary fibroelastomas. Right, and what is the treatment? These tumors have to be rejected. Even though they are asymptomatic, Hmm? Even though they are asymptomatic, resection have to be done. Why? Because they are very highly friable tumors. They can embolize into cerebral circulation or the coronary circulation. Okay? Right. Right. So, that is about your papillary fibroelastomas. Then, the next important the is, the next important benign tumors are the rhabdomyomas and fibromas. So, what all we have discussed until now? Atrial myxoma, then cardiac lipomas, then papillary fibroelasto fibroelastomas, then the other benign tumors are the rhabdomyomas and as well as the fibromas. Remember, these rhabdomyomas and fibromas, they are the most common cardiac tumors in infants and as well as children. And where is the location of these fibro uh, rhabdomyomas and fibromas is? The location of these tumors, they are within the ventricles. That is very, very important. And within the ventricles, they cause the mechanical obstruction, right, within the ventricles, they cause mechanical obstruction to the blood flow, 
right so thereby you know like how do these tumors give a picture similar to this gives a picture similar to that of the aortic stenosis and the pulmonary stenosis and because of this aortic stenosis and pulmonary stenosis you know these will cause the hypertrophy of the myocardium causing the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy right causing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and these tumors they can also cause the pericardial constriction right pericardial constriction okay now let me discuss individually about the rhabdomyoma and then fibroma but remember the most common benign tumors that you come across in infants and children is rhabdomyoma and as well as the fibroma now let me discuss about the rhabdomyomas see these rhabdomyomas they are probably having the hamartomatous growth right they occur in 50 percentage of the tumors in children the benign tumors in children they are the rhabdomyomas and most commonly they occur in children with tuberous sclerosis right 50 percentage of these rhabdomyomas they occur in children with tuberous sclerosis and they constitute 50 percentage of the tumors in children that is benign tumors in children and for the uh, what is the reason for the development of rhabdomyomas in case of the tuberous sclerosis is that is due to mutation of the tumor suppressor genes what are those tumor suppressor genes which are being mutated for the development of this rhabdomyoma is that is tsc1 then tsc2 these tumor mutation in case of the tuberous sclerosis patients will cause the development of the rhabdomyoma now what will be the treatment for these rhabdomyomas all these benign tumors they have to undergo the resection right surgical resection has to undergo but these tumors that is rhabdomyoma they have the tendency to regress completely or partially right but whenever these tumors are causing the obstruction then they have to be resected because what did we discuss this rhabdomyomas and as well as fibromas which are present within which uh, ventricle they cause the lesion in the form of an obstructive pathology so whenever they are causing the obstructive pathology they have to undergo resection but these tumors they have the tendency of undergoing regression either completely or partially and whenever they are causing obstruction reject them off okay and remember rhabdomyomas are common in individuals with tuberous sclerosis and that is mainly because of the mutation of tsc1 and tsc2 gene so this is an imaging which is showing right it is the two dimensional echocardiographic picture which is showing the presence of the cardiac tumor right you see this t these are the tumors right these are the tumors okay so these tumors they are of size of almost 2 into 2 centimeters right they are the one which are present within the ventricle mm? they are present within the left ventricle and some of them they are also present within the right ventricle as well okay and some yeah and yes this is also another tumor mm? this is present within the right atrium mm? so mostly these tumors remember they are present within the ventricles occasionally they can be present within the atria as well which one that is the rhabdomyomas now coming to the fibromas right coming to the fibromas so if you take this fibromas right hamartomatous growth is for the rhabdomyoma these are the solitary tumors they are the single tumors whereas rhabdomyoma multiple tumors whereas this is the solitary single tumor and where is it located location it is in the ventricle and there is a very high tendency that these fibro uh, fibromas they can often get calcified they can often get calcified and these also occur due to mutation of a tumor suppressor gene now what is the tumor suppressor gene is ptch1 okay because of the mutation of this tumor suppressor gene ptch1 that will result in the development of the fibromas and what are the clinical features is these individuals they are at highest risk of development of the arrhythmias and these tumors they also cause the obstructive symptoms and you need to do the complete resection so that will be the treatment for fibromas so remember fibromas they are the solitary tumors they originate within the ventricle and the mutation which is responsible for the fibromas is that is ptch1 and clinical features are arrhythmias and obstructive pathologies and these tumors they have to be completely rejected 
and the other benign tumors are the paragangliomas okay so these paragangliomas as such they are rare chromaffin cell tumors right so actually what are the chromaffin cell tumors the chromaffin cell tumors are the pheochromocytoma which are present within the adrenal medulla so these they represent the extra adrenal pheochromocytoma right <laughs> extra adrenal pheochromocytomas they are called the paragangliomas right and where is the location of these paragangliomas they are located on the roof of the left atrium right these tumors you need to be very careful while handling right so these are highly vascular tumor and they are hormonically very active and the patients will develop the hypertension because of release of these catecholamines and the diagnosis it is being done by ct or mri wherein it will visualize the tumor which is present in the roof of the left atrium and so the localization of the tumor can be done by iodine-131 MIBG scan that is meta benzyl guanidine scan right and how do you treat this even these are also the one which have to undergo the surgical resection so that is about your paragangliomas paragangliomas remember they are the chromaffin cell tumors they represent the extra adrenal pheochromocytoma the location of the tumor is present in the roof of the left atrium the clinical features these are highly vascular tumors hormonically very active they can release catecholamines causing hypertension diagnosis by ct by MR, ct or mri localization can be done by iodine 131 mibg scan and treatment is the surgical resection and the other group of tumors are the hemangiomas and as well as the mesotheliomas hemangiomas and mesotheliomas remember they are the very small tumors and where is the location of these tumors they are the intramyocardial tumors right they are the intramyocardial in location and these tumors they can cause the compression of the av node so they will have av node compression disturbances and what will be that that will be in the form of bradyarrhythmias Mm, that will be in the form of the bradyarrhythmias okay and because of the bradyarrhythmias they can develop the sudden cardiac death then how will you diagnose this the hemangiomas and as well as the mesotheliomas see they are like intramyocardial tumor so you can do ct or mri for visualizing the tumor and the treatment is the resection okay so until now what are all the benign tumors we have discussed the most common brain, benign tumor is the atrial myxomas then followed by the atrial myxomas the next important is the cardiac lipomas next is the papillary fibroelastomas then we have rhabdomyoma and as well as the fibromas and then followed by that we have the hemangiomas and as well as mesotheliomas and yeah so these are the benign tumors and we have some more benign tumors these are all the benign tumors that is teratoma chemodectoma neurilemoma granular granular cell uh, myoblastoma and then paraganglioma but these are very very rare okay and regarding paraganglioma we have discussed that now after having done with the benign tumors now let me discuss the malignant tumors malignant tumors they are mainly the sarcomas right they are mainly the sarcomas and these malignant tumors they occur in adults and as well as children right but they are more common in adults than compared to that of children and they are more common in men than compared to that of women right so they can also occur even within the children as well but most of them are what they are sarcomas but they are most commonly seen in adults and the tumors the, the sarcoma that you see in adult that is called angiosarcoma right and the sarcoma that you see in children that will be rhabdomyosarcoma right that will be rhabdomyosarcoma okay so rhabdomyosarcoma that will be the most common malignant tumor that you can come across in children now in this malignant tumors what will be the clinical features again same cardiac manifestations are there metastatic manifestations are there so almost one third are metastatic at the time of the diagnosis because malignant tumors the very important property is what metastasis okay and where do they metastasize more commonly into they metastasize more commonly into the lung now if you take the cardiac manifestations you have right heart and as well as the left heart involvement in case of the sarcomas so if you take the right heart involvement 
from the right heart the tumor which is originating they are erythemogenic so they develop erythemias they can also develop the right heart failure and these individuals they also develop the constitutional symptoms in constitutional symptoms already we have discussed what are all they in atrial myxomas then you take this few more right sided features are that okay sarcomas they commonly involve the right side of the heart then compared to that of the left side of the heart and the one which are growing on the right side remember these sarcomas they are rapidly growing and they frequently involve the pericardial space right they frequently involve the pericardial space and they cause the obstruction of hmm, they cause the obstruction of the cardiac chambers and they cause the obstruction of cardiac chambers and they also cause the obstruction of the vena cava okay so that is about your right heart tumors then if you take the left heart tumors okay left heart sarcomas are less common than compared to that of the right heart okay and the sarcomas occasionally they occur on the left side of the heart right and sometimes the one what we are considering it as sarcomas they may be even myxomas as well and next thing is the treatment if you observe the another form of the malignant tumor the presentation can be in the form of the lymphoma right and that lymphoma will be isolated cardiac lymphoma can be present and this isolated cardiac lymphoma this is rarely described right but most commonly occur in the context of a systemic disease then how do you treat first right so please remember now overall the malignant tumors are called sarcomas right now these sarcomas they are the one which are characterized by the rapid progression because they are malignant tumors so that is the reason why they can have rapid progression and they can have sudden cardiac death within weeks to months so how do you treat these patients so again it is the same story that is the complete resection has to be done right complete resection has to be done okay and along with that if you find that the tumor has metastasized what did we discuss most of the times the tumor will metastasize to the lung so these patients they require post operative chemotherapy mainly to treat that metastasis okay that is about the treatment for your sarcomas right then occasionally these tumors like particularly you take this uh, cardiac lymphomas that is the one we call it as the primary lymphomas these cardiac lymphomas they require chemotherapy and as well as the radiotherapy okay so that is about the treatment for the malignant tumors now after having discussed about the primary tumors so we have discussed that the tumors within the heart they are like metastatic tumors and then the primary tumors which are more common between these two metastatic tumors are more common than compared to that of the primary tumors and primary tumors are mainly myxomas and your benign tumors are mainly the myxomas and malignant tumors are mainly sarcomas and sarcomas in adults again it is the angiosarcoma and in children that is rhabdomyosarcoma right and these sarcomas are very more common in adults than compared to that of the children and what will be the manifestations you can have right and as well as left heart manifestations in case of sarcomas but remember right sided involvement is more common than compared to that of the left side involvement and these patients they can have rapid progression to sudden cardiac death and next is the treatment complete resection and if there is metastasis you need to do post operative chemotherapy and another form is the cardiac lymphomyosarcoma so if there is lymphoma then you along with the chemotherapy you also give the radiotherapy as well now coming to the metastatic tumors so what did we discuss the metastatic tumors are much more common than compared to that of the primary tumors right and the incidence of this metastatic tumors are increasing these days why because the life expectancy of the individual is growing why the life expectancy of the individual is growing because there is a extensive effective therapy and there are very good imaging modalities which can cause the complete resolution of the metastasis right so now when you are using the word metastasis where will be the primary in case of the cardiac metastasis right remember the most common primary site from which 
right most common primary site from which the cardiac metastasis originate are carcinoma of breast and lung okay so carcinoma of the breast and lung they are the most common primary site for the cardiac metastasis right and what are the other sites right what are the other sites apart from the carcinoma of the breast and lung so these carcinomas they may also come from malignant melanoma right they may also come from the malignant melanoma and to certain extent even from the lymphoma but most common is from the carcinoma of the breast and as well as the lung now what are the various routes of metastasis so remember it can be hematogenous route of spread it could be the lymphatic spread it could be even the direct tumor invasion it could be even direct tumor invasion and if you take the pathology of these metastatic tumors they are very small tumors right and they are like very firm in consistency and they are nodular right they are nodular and sometimes nodular means like confined to one particular area sometimes there can be even diffuse infiltration as well right sometimes there can be diffuse infiltration as well especially for the sarcomas now what are the structures which are affected in case of the metastatic tumors it is most commonly the pericardium where the metastatic foci are being located followed by the pericardium the next important structure which is being involved is the myocardium so myocardium involvement will be there and subsequent myocardium of any chamber can get affected and followed by that rarely there can be involvement of the endocardium and as well as the valves right involvement of the endocardium and as well as the valves then what will be the clinical features of these metastatic tumors right remember these uh, cardiac metastases are clinically apparent only 10% of the time right and usually they do not cause any symptomatology and rarely they are associated with death and the clinical features completely depends upon the location of the tumor it completely depends upon the size of the tumor and it also depends upon the histological type and if at all if they are symptomatic the symptoms they include the dyspnea because of the development of the heart failure and because they are commonly entering into the pericardium they can cause pericarditis where the individual can develop chest pain so chest pain is mainly because of the development of acute pericarditis by the metastatic foci next is these tumors they can cause a very important emergency that is in the form of the cardiac tamponade where there is abrupt accumulation of the fluid in the pleural space and the electrical abnormalities in the form of tachyarrhythmias or bradyarrhythmias can be there but when will this happen when the tumor is metastasizing to the sa node or av node then they can develop this tachy or bradyarrhythmias and dyspnea is mainly because of the development of the congestive heart failure now these clinical features in these patients with the metastasis they can be even secondary to radiotherapy and as well as the chemotherapy right for this myocarditis right what is that we are doing for the metastasis we are giving radiotherapy and chemotherapy this radiotherapy and chemotherapy itself can induce the development of the pericarditis or the myocarditis right they can induce pericarditis or myocarditis and sometimes even cardiomyopathy as well so you can have the clinical features secondary to treatment for the metastasis as well then how will you diagnose these tumors echo ecg and as well as the chest x ray right so in echo so most common site for metastasis is where that is to the pericardium so what is that you will observe within the pericardium you will observe the presence of the pericardial effusion right and if the tumors are you can also visualize the tumor and you can determine the size and as well as the location but for better visualization but for betterment of 
making out the size of the tumor the ct scan of the chest that will be more preferable and the radionuclide imaging so ct and as well as the radionuclide imaging they are being more preferred right they are being more preferred while doing uh, then compared to that of the 2d echo for making out this metastatic tumors right then okay so this is like uh, uh, one of the two dimensional echocardiographic picture where you can make out the presence of large metastatic tumor within the left ventricle right and uh, yeah so the mass right where it is just adjacent to the interventricular septum and this can cause the obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract next is the echocardiographic picture that is easy that is about easy echo if you take the ecg ECG findings they are like non specific it all depends upon what is the manifestation for example if this metastasis has caused pericarditis the picture that you will have is global st concave st segment elevation except st depression in avr and there will be pr segment depression in all the leads except in avr there will be pr segment elevation and if suppose if this particular tumor is causing pericardial effusion then you will have low voltage complexes or there can be electrical alternance if there is massive pericardial effusion then there will be development of electrical alternance where you have alternating large and as well as small complexes within the ecg so that is about the ecg then coming to the chest x ray so in the chest x ray the cardiac silhet is most often normal but may be enlarged or exhibit a bizarre contour so the cardiac silhet most of the times it may be normal but occasionally it can get even enlarged so that is about the investigation so mainly you need to localize the tumor better is by ct and as well as the radionuclide imaging now the other methods of visualizing the tumors are the cardiac mri so cardiac mri you know this will provide the better quality in visualizing the tumor then compared to that of your ct right so cardiac mri it offers superb image quality and it plays a central role so if you ask me what is the investigation of choice for the cardiac metastasis that will be your mri right then what about the pericardiocentesis pericardiocentesis if you want to do the cytological analysis right if you want to make out what is the cell type then you need to do the pericardiocentesis and that will be uh, done if the individual develops the pericardial effusion and what about the angiography angiography is being rarely done that is mainly to delineate the myocardial lesions okay but otherwise not required investigation of choice will be mri now how do you treat these patients with the metastasis remember most of these patients with cardiac metastasis they have advanced stages of malignant disease so that is the reason why mostly the treatment is the palliative treatment right and you should do symptomatic control pericarditis is there just give analgesic or the anti inflammatory drug massive pleural pericardial effusion is there then you do pericardial synthesis so it is only symptomatic treatment and then you need to treat the primary tumor okay either it might be carcinoma lung or carcinoma breast or bladder carcinoma whatever it is you need to treat the primary tumor right and pericardial synthesis should be done if there is massive pericardial effusion causing the compression of the heart okay and see pericardial synthesis is very very important because the most common structure which is affected is pericardium and there is very high chance that these individuals will develop the pericardial effusion so whenever you take you place that pericardial synthesis tube that is the drainage tube you have to leave it for nearly around 3 to 5 days why because there is high chance of recurrence so in order to prevent the development of recurrence what you need to do is you need to inject the sclerosing agent right you need to inject the sclerosing agent and this sclerosing agent is tetracycline or right tetracycline or the bleomycin have to be injected into the pericardial space and that will prevent the sclerosis okay so that is about your pericardio synthesis but remember these cardiac metastases overall they have poor prognosis 
right overall they have poor prognosis so this completes the discussion of your cardiac tumors so how did we classify them the primary tumors and then metastatic tumors to the heart metastatic tumors are more common than primary tumors primary tumors again benign tumor that is myxomas more common malignant tumors they are sarcomas metastatic tumors most common primary will be the breast and as well as lung and benign tumors right they are benign right they can be easily treated by surgical resection so this is about your cardiac tumors thank you very much